This morning, everyone. In this talk, I'll look at a cult radio with particular interest in the uncanny by exploring sound as a concept and technology before looking at the development of radio and radio genre from the 1920s to the 40s. And we'll have a little trip to the theatre in the middle of the talk as well. There's always been something uncanny about sound. The fact that it's literally invisible means that it can stealthily surround us and permeate our environment. In the form of music, it can manipulate our mood, sometimes reinforcing or just as easily undercutting with irony whatever we may be observing. It can go even deeper than that. In his 1906 lecture, The Occult Basis of Music, Rudolf Steiner asserts that when a man is in the experience of music, he's living in the image of his spiritual home. Throughout the history of civilization, sound phenomena such as echoes and Eolian harps have eerily fascinated us. In the world of Gothic popular culture, although we may think of ruined castles, empty suits of armour and apparitions like crumpled linen, we might argue that it's the rich soundscape of thunder, whispers, screams and other things that go bump in the night that has done most to make our hearts beat faster. This extends to horror cinema. Sound designer Graham Resnick has worked on Ty West's horror movies, um, including The Innkeepers. When I interviewed him, he revealed that in a world where viewers know every trick and cliche in the visual repertoire, sound is still a bit of a black art, which has the great ability to unwrite and rewrite reality at any time. So sound is a black art with a covert manipulative ability to transform surface reality. In this regard, it's easy to see how significant sound can be in relation to the occult, if we consider the literal meaning of the occult as the hidden or concealed. The invisible potency of sound makes it instantly relevant in context of sound technology as much as cultural representation. Christopher Partridge helpfully outlines that in the Renaissance, the boundaries between occultism and the new science were porous and the relationship conspicuous and how even in the Enlightenment, when the occult was beginning to become a derogatory term used to indicate not profanity but irrationality, figures like Isaac Newton, whose interest in astrology, alchemy, and other occultist topics make him, to quote John Maynard Keynes, not the first of the age of reason, but last of the magicians. What's interesting, however, is that we can find examples of the occult being detected in relation to science in a much later period, not least when Ronald Hutton makes clear Alistair Crowley insists on the relationship of his magic to science rather than religion. The ramifications of the occult can be detected in the development of sound technology in particular. This means that as well as a rational history of audio technology from the late 19th century onwards, a story of technological refinement and lawsuits appertaining to copyright, there's also an alternative history. As Geoffrey Sconce argues, there's a shadow history of telecommunications that continues to this day. <coughs> That's uh, Marconi's transmitter there, a friendly Gothic image of that on the coast. For Sconce, in a context of the separation of the secular and the spiritual, there are examples of scientific innovation where corporeal common sense is defied, leading to nervous ambivalence, a simultaneous desire and dread of actually making such extraordinary forms of content. <coughs> Following this, if we look at key scientists in the development of sound technology, we might be struck by their use of language, the experiments they conducted, and the reception of their inventions. For instance, in an 1899 interview, Nikola Tesla comes across as a visionary as much as a scientist, asserting that human beings once had wings, and describing one of his greatest achievements like this. Watching the sunset, thousands of fire were turning around in thousands of flaming colours, I remembered Faust and recited his verses, and then, as in fog, I saw spinning magnetic field and induction motor. I saw them from the sun. So less a moment of scientific eureka than an epiphany, wherein Faust is more relevant than any scientific predecessor. Similarly, um, Orrin Dunlap's um, biography of Marconi from the 30s frequently seems to stray in less than scientific language. The chapter that recounts the development of wireless telegraphy is titled Acts in an Occult Drama. He sets the scene thus. Mankind's accelerated pace needed communication more rapid than the mail carried by an ocean liner, faster than airplane dispatch, quicker than the telegraph or telephone. The stage was set in this occult drama for the entrance of a practical-minded scientist, a master magician, to make it work. 
witchery, the man to perform such wizardry in the span of human life would be immortal. So a man who could instantly send a message across the Atlantic evidently had a talent that excelled mere scientific innovation. In fact, Emily Moran cites a 1919 interview with John B. Yates where he suggests that W. B. Yates had been thinking about Marconi's invention of wireless as a foundational moment that yielded new cognitive possibilities. To quote, expect a great Marconi someday to explain the occult to us. Thomas Edison is generally seen as a rationalist, bluntly explaining why church attendance was declining with people are drifting away from superstition and bunk increase in scientific knowledge is responsible. However, as shadow historians, we can note a, locate a rather different Edison. When he first uh, experimented with sound recording, he was not just amazed at the results, he was frightened. I was never so taken aback in my life. Everybody was astonished. I was always afraid of things that worked the first time. <clears throat> in 1920, he attempted to create a machine through which the dead would communicate with the living. Edison's spirit catcher would capture the voices of the dead, harvesting swarms of memory released after death as a telescope captures the light of distant stars. Insinuations of occultism followed which is probably one reason why Edison later backtracked, claiming it was all a joke. The fact that Edison conducted these experiments in the immediate aftermath of the First World War reflects, like the contempor contemporaneous revival in spiritualism, a hopeful, perhaps desperate remedy to cataclysmic grief. There is something haunting about the recording of voices. Edison's own recording of Florence Nightingale, for instance, presents us not with a frozen photograph, but the necromantic paradox of a living, breathing, yet disembodied voice who crosses the veil to speak to us of our own mortality and immortality. Through the crackle and distortion of wax, a haunting slice of time and personality. Tim Crook finds something similar in the recorded testimony of the soldier Edward Dwyer, who chats to us about life in the trenches that will die in the song soon afterwards. For Crook, the unique insight we're given by Dwyer's informal voice, combined with our knowledge of his imminent death, creates a powerful example of Derridean ontology, where the present only exists in relation to ghosts of the past. The hauntological nature of sound recording, as well as Edison's spirit catcher, is a small step away from paranormal investigation in the field of electronic voice phenomena, EVP, by Constantine Rodeve and others, who've attempted to capture voices in the recordings of empty rooms and the white noise of out of tune radio. This fascination was evident in the earliest days of radio broadcasting. As Geoffrey Sconce reveals, in the 1920s, there was an eerie trend for ghost broadcasting in which microphones were left operational in empty studios to capture the voices of ghosts. When experiments in radio broadcasting became practical, they were also something otherworldly. In fact, they were nothing short of miraculous. In 1906, Reginald Fessenden transmitted choir music and a Bible reading, and wireless operators who didn't realise an experiment was occurring picked up the broadcast. They assumed they were listening to the sounds of heaven. But as well as miracles on the air, radio's early history was also linked to the macabre and notorious, which made the benefits of radio universally apparent. In July 1910, a ship's captain recognised one of his passengers and used the radio to contact the police who captured the fugitive Dr. Crippen as he attempted to disembark. And an immediate consequence of the Titanic in 1912 was that international law obliged all ships to be uh, equipped with radio. Within a few years, broadcast radio had taken off globally with phenomenal success and a drive for content to fuel the voracious appetite of the listeners following. With radio drama in the 1920s, there was a recurrent interest in thrillers and mysteries including uncanny plays about ghosts, witches, and seances. This is partly because such themes could exploit radio's inherent uncanniness and its, it, the kind of sheer magic of disembodied voices talking live in our domestic space. Um, also, radio could be one of the most modernist of media, intimacy, interiority, immersing us in narrative and consciousness. Um, this is why, for one reason, in 1938, the BBC adapted Cabinet of Dr. Caligari for radio. It may seem like audacity to take such a visual classic, but the surviving script, there's no recording, but the script reveals a dreamlike experience of 
dialogue and soundscape, which finds an oral equivalent in expression style or somnambulism where it's really rather pure radio. Another reason for the appeal of the uncanny in 1920s British radio was the BBC's close relationship with the theatre. A case in point is, is London's Grand Guignol, which closed in 1922, but by 1924, actors like Russell and Sybil Thorndike uh, and writers like Richard Hughes and Reginald Arkell, who was central to the London Grand Guignol, were working for the BBC. In the brief theatrical aside I promised you, we find in the Grand Guignol a perfect training ground for early radio drama. The Grand Guignol, in its Parisian home and London offshoot, specialised in short horror plays. And radio had the same kind of taste. Sybil Thorndike starred in The Medium in 1920, in which a mesmerised woman reveals the secret of a Svengardian sculptor's great art. Corpses are underneath the plaster. Um, and in a shameless chance to plug my new book, sorry, <laughs> Performing Grand Guignol, we've translated for the first time to Lord and Boche's The Great Terror a play in which a mysterious Egyptian doctor sets up a practice in London with an open tomb in his basement and his successful remedies use fresh animal blood. In the local colonial club, the doctor's beliefs are subjected to debate. I'm just going to quote a quick dialogue. There are too many people these days who swear by these stupid ideas that are as old as the hills, magic, sorcery, occultism. Uh, excuse me, occultism is really very interesting. Interesting, you think so? Certainly. Well, that depends on your point of view. As far as I'm concerned, I don't very much care for all that. These otherworldly things, believe me, they're best left well alone. It's the play is a tale of Orientalism and bloody revenge. These British colonials deserve the occultist horrors meted out to them, especially as it's a French play. One actor in the 1920s Grand Guignol was Franklin Dial, father of Valentine Dial, who would become the host of BBC's most famous horror series, A Point of Fear. In fact, on one occasion during the Second World War, when Valentine Dial was unable to play the man in black, he was replaced by his own father. Apart from keeping it in the family, Franklin Dial's experiences acting at the London Grand Guignol must have equipped him most suitably to play the role of British, horror, uh, British Radio's greatest horror host 20 years later. Appointment with fear was developed in a deliberately American style, with knife chords, high drama, and consistently macabre themes. It was seen as a risk initially, and actually that carried on through its run at one point in the 40s, there's a, a memoranda sent internally at the BBC where one producer says, after a particularly kind of gruesome play, he says, are we catering for an audience of morons or just trying to create one? You know, people trying to block this very, very popular show. Part of the package uh, in the American style was a need for a host. And in some way, the colourful hosts of the airwaves define much of American horror radio. Here we have Raymond at Inner Sanctum Mysteries, a figure like a magician, a stage magician there who frames each week's story, an ironic, all-seeing master of the air, talking directly to us, and often more impactful than natural stories he's presenting in the brain. Appointment with Fear's host was Valentine Dial, the man in black. Um, and here's a, a wonderful, rare picture of him in action. Notes that left hand, you know, torting, really getting his teeth into the, into the gruesomeness. Um, a cult built around him, um, this macabre, ever, the ever witty figure. And it's fueled not least by the Radio Times, and this is one feature where they describe him before a new series. Tall and lean, with a voice that has a compelling, almost mesmeric effect on the listener. Valentine is by no means as sinister as his man in black would have us believe, though he admits he's always been interested in the paranormal. Dial reveals in the same article, I've even been stopped in the street and told by a man that I'd frightened his wife that if I continued with the series, they'd be in trouble. Um, the mastermind behind um, Appointment with Fear was John Dixon Carr, the American writer, master of the locked room mystery, you know, where there's a seemingly supernatural crime but it's given a very rational explanation, ultimately. Um, An Appointment with Fear is a series loved, curses, and the occult, um, terrific versions of the monkey's paw and things like that. Although more frequently there'd be a logical explanation in what we now say a kind of Scooby Doo style, you know, it's all revealed at the end. The occultists are con men, the scientists are charlatans. And to give one example, a wonderful play from 1944 called The Great Cipher, the listener is taken to the Congo in a play of seeming black magic in which a dreadful monster summoned from the earth is described. And this is someone's sworn account. The creature's head was enormous, square in shape 
almost without features. Its limbs were long, narrow, and jointed. The whole creature was of a repulsive reddish color. Its body seemed to be made of some hard red substance, frozen, polished flesh after the skin had been removed. This terrifying creature is eventually revealed to be the common red ant, the description of ancient science. Um, in another play, All Cats May Snarl, from 1947, the man in black opens with a speech on numerology, and a subsequent play about the power of fate develops this principle with a key number seven, which defines the life and doom of the central character. But it's subtly present elsewhere. It's a really wonderfully kind of impressive, impressively careful and listened to happen of the number seven truly play. Um, Another writer uh, associated with The Man in Black was John Keir Cross, who made the formula more overtly supernatural with a series called The Man in Black. Um, and that had all this adaptation to M.R. James and uh, John Colley as Thus I Review PLC and things like that. Um, in a personal anecdote, uh, Cross gives an account of how he once invited the devil to broadcast on BBC Radio. It was a live broadcast from a BBC studio in Scotland for Halloween in the early 1950s. The broadcast was apparently a documentary discussion focusing on the occult in history, considering the legends surrounding the Vatican as well, before speculating on the possibility of present-day black magic activities. Cross recounts how a magic circle was drawn around the microphone, and an incantation for summoning the devil was recited, followed by two minutes of dead air. Nothing occurred in the studio, although listeners reported EVP. Later the same night, Cross's six-month-old baby was viciously attacked by an enormous rat which had mysteriously gained entry to the child's impregnable little room, an incident which, an incident which Cross himself says makes him almost believe it was a direct consequence of offering the devil a guest slot on BBC Scotland. Um, and this sort of builds on, this is in the early 50s, sort of outside of the era we're looking at, but it's a tradition of the documentary on BBC Radio. In 1936, the BBC broadcast the first, um, first broadcast from a haunted house, joining the famous ghost hunter Harry Price on one of his investigations. In the 1940s, the BBC aired a, a drama series, a long forgotten one, called Mystery and Imagination, which explored the uncanny, predominantly featuring adaptations. And the first episode was Golden Dragon City, a radio dra dramatization of Lord Dunsinane's The Wonderful Window. It's that terrific tale of a, of a window that gives a view onto a fantastical city. Um, absolutely great radio. Um, but the, the radio ad adaptation was written by Lord Dunsinane himself, whose works were not new to radio. Back in the 1920s, the BBC in Cardiff actually broadcast a special Dunsinane night. Um, Another kind of example of sort of uh, documentary was a show in uh, the mid-40s called Is There Anything In It? A series of documentaries in dramatic form. And the extant production file reveals that extensive research was undertaken into occult subjects. In the episodes on palmistry and telepathy, for instance, a number of practicing mediums and psychics were invi invited to be involved. The program strove to strike a balance between the supernatural and the rational, with a strong leaning towards the latter as internal memorandum reveal. You know, that's what they're worried about. Um, ghost contact shows and things like that, so maybe this is going to disturb the listeners, and you know, we must have a scientific view on this as well. In this regard, an effort's often made to ground themes historically. So in the episode of Is There Anything In It About Lycanthropy, the episode's author writes um, in the Radio Times saying, in every part of the globe there are legends of men and women transformed into beasts. Where does legend stop and fact begin? In the plague and famine-stricken Middle Ages, human nature suffered degradation to which a modern counterpart was revealed last year when the armies of liberation reached Nelson. That's from 1946. Okay. Um, just to sort of wrap, wrap up, really, I mean, it's a very rich era, as I hope you can see. Um, the inherent uncanny nature of radio was itself you know, very conducive to studies in the occult of documentary and dramatic form, as well as the experiments with EVP. Um, now, for me, studying radio, it's an immensely exciting time. The web has given us an era rich in experimental and esoteric work, like the 1920s, before broadcasting conformed to the regulation post sort of changes. 
Old radio plays now are streamed, spoken word proliferates, and for the occultists there are specialist stations like Paratruth Radio, Out There Radio, while Canary Cry Radio has its own Amsterdam Crowley archive. And KRMA, KRMA has um, Alistair Crowley as one of its DJs, complete with a picture of the Alistair Crowley, even though the description, most wicked man on earth? No, just a long-haired rock and roller. Somebody's taken on this guy for his weekly broadcast. So through radio, that most modernist and hauntological of media, the occult lives 